Hey, this is Artie Cabral. This is Sarah Nofke. This is Stefan Boltz. This is S. Elliot Brandis, and you're listening to 30, 30, 30, 30 Minute Author Interviews with Preston Lay. Woohoo! Welcome, everybody, to this episode of 30 Minute Author Interviews. Our guest today is author Josh Hayes. Thanks for taking time out of your day and coming on. Oh man, thanks for having me on. It's it's really weird being on this side of the microphone, this side of the uh, the questions. <laughs> I'm usually the one doing the intro and doing the questions, and now I'm I'm not. It is fun. It's r- roles reversed. Well, definitely for you, but for me, I listen to you every week. So this is this is definitely fun. <laughs> so. uh, put put me on the spot with all your hard hard uh, questions. I'm That's ready. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, we've started off things new here. Uh, the way we do this. We do two truths and a lie. So if you could, I think I might actually be like slightly above 500 unless I get yours wrong. Um, so if you could, what what are your two truths and a lie about you? Okay. I have stood on the top of a nuclear missile silo. Okay. I I met my wife on a treadmill and I ran a marathon in under four hours. Man, I'm getting this one wrong. <laughs> there's, there's, they all sound like it could be true. Um, dang, the silo thing I could see has. I could see all of them happening. This is awful. Um, I've never seen. Of course, I haven't been following you like a long time, but I don't know if I've ever seen you post anything about running a marathon. So I'm going to say. That r- the running a marathon in under four hours is the lie. Wow, uh, you're you're correct. Am I? <laughs> you you are correct. Uh, but I have run a marathon. I ran it in five hours and thirty minutes, not hey. in four hours. Okay. So uh, I- and it was a horrible, horrible experience. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever do it again? No, never do it again. <laughs> That's nope. funny. I've so- done it, and I've got my little. Uh, my little metal hanging from the wall, and uh, that's it. That's all I need. I'm good. <laughs> there we go. So now I have to ask, if it's not too personal of a story, how did you meet your wife on a treadmill? Okay, so um, around the time that I was doing all my running and, and getting back into shape and lifting weights, um, I would go to the Y in the mornings, and um, I would you know, see the people there, but then this – really attractive uh woman caught my eye and i kind of did like the gym creeper deal like i was always you know you have you have so many mirrors at the gym like right. everywhere because everybody wants to so i was doing like the the look off one mirror that reflects off another mirror that hits another mirror so i could like check out this girl <laughs> and have her not see that i was looking at her like the whole time <laughs> and so i did that um probably for a good like month before I actually worked up the courage to go and talk to her. And uh, I actually, she was on a elliptical one morning and I went up and got next to her on the elliptical and then chickened out. And, <laughs> and so uh, a couple weeks later she was on the treadmill and I was like, screw it. You're, you're being dumb. Just go talk to her. And so I got on the treadmill next to her and I'm running. And finally, after like half an hour, she stops running and so I really quickly hit the walk button and start walking and I turned to her and I go, so are you training for anything specific? And as soon as I said it, I was like, that is the stupidest thing. Anybody, that's the worst pickup line in the history of pickup lines. Uh, and so we we just started talking and it, it happened um, the day that I met her was actually on her birthday. Nice. And she invited me to come to her birthday party that night and – um, I had to go to another party before that. And so there was about a two hour, um, break in between. And as I'm texting her to get her address, she's not texting me back. And I'm like, Oh man, she's blowing me off. Like this. <laughs> oh, what a big dummy I am. And then finally, um, I called her just as a last ditch, whatever I'm, I'm calling her. And she answered the phone. She's sorry. I couldn't hear my text messages, but this is my address and showed up and, and that was it. That was the whole shebang. So, uh, yeah. 
So did you ever do the, we've all seen the funny videos where you, the, the guy in the gym's checking out a girl and he falls on the treadmill and starts doing pushups. Did you ever do that? Uh, luckily, no, <laughs> I'm sure that I've, I'm sure that I've dropped a couple weights, like, and then just played it off. Like whatever I'm done, I ain't racking those weights and walk away from it, but, uh, never fall off the treadmill though. That is hilarious. That's an interesting story. Actually, that's, that's funny. I actually met my wife because my brother was became friends with her friend so oh nice um, yeah so <laughs> that's a, uh, always interesting stories uh, yes so for those that might not know who you are or what you do why don't you kind of let everybody know who you are and what you do uh well i'm i'm an author slash podcaster slash dad slash today i was a housekeeper and um i have been uh, a reader my entire life, and I've almost been a writer my entire life. I, uh, I've i always loved science fiction. My mother got me into watching Star Trek The Next Generation, um, and I've watched almost probably every episode of that at least two or three times, and um, we read The Hardy Boys growing up, and, and all those books you read as a kid, I, I, I soaked them all in, but I always, always loved science fiction. And um, I wrote my first uh, story. It wasn't a novel or a book or whatever you want to call it. I wrote my first book when I was 14 uh, on a uh, one notebook or one uh, subject notebook, you know, the wide rule. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I still have it somewhere. (laughs) Uh, It's in a a briefcase with a whole bunch of other stories that shall not be named. And uh, and. I put it away for a while. I've always, you know, continued to read. Um, and then I got out of the military. So I, uh, and, um, joined a local police department here in town and met another guy. Uh, you had him on your show last week, Scott Moon, and he introduced me to, um, indie publishing. And once I realized, cause you know, a lot of people say, Oh, you know, you write it and you get rejected a hundred times and that's just part of being a come being a writer. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't like that idea at all. <laughs> I hated the idea of getting rejected and spending all that time and effort on writing something and then getting rejected. I couldn't stand it. And so then when I found out about indie publishing, I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. And just kind of, uh, started writing and I've got, uh, two, uh, books that aren't quite novels. They're I, I had the idea from Hugh Howie and Michael Bunker when uh, Hugh Howie did Wool and then Michael Bunker did Pennsylvania that I was going to do five 25,000 word novellas and then do the omnibus. Mm-hmm. So I got the first one done, which is uh, Breaking Through, uh, the first book in my second star series. And then when I wrote the second book, it was double the length. And now my third one's triple the length. Oh, and wow. I haven't written it. Yeah. So my idea to do the the serialized kind of release didn't work at all. And so (laughs) never doing that again. Um, (laughs) So, uh, but I've been in a couple anthologies now. Um, I've been in Patrice Fitzgerald's uh, mostly murder anthology uh, with my short story, uh, the long haul. And then uh, uh, Nathan Heistead of Woodbridge press does the uh, exploration anthology series. And I'm in um, Through the Wormhole and then another one that's coming out just a couple days uh, from I think when you release this podcast. It'll I think we release on January 29th with that book. Okay. And so that'll be my fifth published work, I guess. Awesome. Um, I didn't know that. So you and Scott live in the, in the same same area. Same. We, we actually work in the same – we call it a bureau, but precinct, same station. Okay. Uh, and um, we used to have the same days off, and now our days off are, are sw- swapped around. But, yeah, work, we work for the same um, department. So I didn't get to ask him. Um, it, it kind of slipped my mind. How, how did y'all end up uh, – for those that don't know, you and – you and Scott run a keystroke medium. Um, right. How did y'all decide to start doing that? How did all that come about? Um, it, it was a very organic growing thing when it first started. And, and um, we, 
were, we started meeting about once every week. We'd go to like Starbucks or Panera or something and we'd hang out for like an hour, hour and a half or whatever. Sometimes we'd do writing sprints. Sometimes we'd talk about like, Hey, what are we doing with our books and different things? Um, but it was just, we didn't have anybody to talk to about writing and, you know, our wives are very supportive, but they don't get it. Like I, I can't sit down and talk with my wife about it. Mm-hmm. And so we did that just to kind of keep our creative juices flowing and motivate each other. And then one time we couldn't do it. Like our schedules didn't match up where like I had, think I had the baby at the time or I had all my kids at the time and I couldn't leave them to go do the – I mean I guess I could, but that's probably not a good thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I couldn't, I couldn't go to meet him and so we just decided, well, why don't we just meet? you know, online somehow and talk online. And, uh, so we met a couple times online and talk for an hour and I don't even remember how we first did it, but, uh, I had been talking with another buddy about doing a podcast cause I thought it was interesting. And I said, Hey dude, why don't we just, why don't we just somehow record this and put it out there and call that our podcast. Like we sit down and we talk about writing and we got thoughts about it. I'm sure everybody else has thoughts about it and they'd be interested. So that's kind of how it evolved. And then we had about two and a half months worth of just us talking about stuff. And then we had our first guest who, uh, our first guest was Ralph Kern. And now he's actually a part of the business, um, as a, as a, a member of the company. And it's just, it's grown from there. And, uh, it's, it's been a wild ride the last, uh, nine months of the show that we've been doing it. It's been crazy. So uh, how long have y'all been doing that now? Since, uh, we started, uh, I think we started planning it in March and I think our first episode was in April, I think. April of uh, last year? April of, uh, 2016. Yep. Okay. Wow. So it's not even been a year yet. Uh, uh-uh. nope. wow. That's impressive. It's uh, it's really taken off. I mean, we've had uh, Peter F. Hamilton on the show. Um, we've had uh, Nicholas Sansbury Smith, uh, Samuel Peralta, Patrice Fitzgerald, like all these these names. That when you're in in the industry and you hear these names, you're like, oh yeah, we know who that is. And you know, some of the some of the guests we have on, we're like, oh, I can't I can't believe we were able to score an interview with these people. <laughs> it's yeah. just it's so <laughs> it's so cool, you know. It is. So, do you remember what? what book it was that sparked your interest and made you write your first story? I, I can't remember what book specifically, but I, I'm sure that, that it was, I was reading, uh, some, Oh man, what was I reading? I can't remember. I was reading these little, at the, uh, my parents are very religious. And so I used to go to church every Sunday and all that stuff. And they, they, Generally, unless it was Hardy Boys, I, I usually listen to uh, usually Christian centric books or, or read Christian centric books. And it was a sci fi book for for kids. It was a YA book, and it was called uh, Zanon, Z A N O N, and it was a a very small book. And I remember reading that and um, watching Star Trek, and that's kind of where the story kind of evolved. I wanted to do kind of a cool. Uh, science fiction adventure type book, and that's kind of the the what the first book was. But I, I can't remember what exactly I was reading that that kicked off my wanting to write that book. It just kind of I was like, I want to write this, and started doing it. Um, so you said that you have a series out there called uh, Second Star, and the the first two books are out now. Um, can you tell the viewer or listeners kind of the non spoiler book blurb on what that series is about? Uh, absolutely. You know, it's funny that you say non spoiler because I tried so hard when I released the first novella to not spoil anything about it. I, I was like, people are going to get to the end of this book, and they're going to just their minds are going to get blown away. And so I didn't do – I did very little pushing for the first book to to get people interested in it. And basically the, the way I, I described the first book when I first released it was this um, near future fighter pilot gets sucked through a wormhole and gets dropped onto an alien planet and is chased by some really mean people. Um and then at the end of the first book, and this is, it, it is a spoiler, but it's not anymore because I've been pushing it as this is that planet, that planet that they live on, uh, turns out to be, uh, Neverland. Okay. And, um, the whole premise of the book came from, I was trying to brainstorm ideas 
uh, to write. And I said, well, what if I write a fairy tale, but I make the good guy the bad guy? And so Second Star is is uh, uh, from Second Star to the Right. Um, oh, okay. And, and the break I, – I, I've used – taken basically the story of Peter Pan and done a kind of a science fiction reimagining of it. If you've ever seen like Tin Man, the the miniseries that was on the sci-fi channel like 10 years ago or something, they took Oz and like kind of made it into some steampunk magical type of deal. Um, I basically took the idea of Pan and brought a whole bunch of sci-fi elements into it uh, and made Neverland kind of an alien planet and um, all the characters that are in the, the book, they're most, most of those named characters are named characters in my series. So um, obviously Peter Pan, um, Hook, Wendy, Michael, John, um, some of the characters like, um, like Tinkerbell. I, I, it's not Tinkerbell in the book. It's Bella in the book. Um, and then I have some of the, um, the pirates, like the one of the pirates in the in the original Peter Pan, is named Starkey, and so I pulled that name over and I used Starkey in this book, like a, like an Easter egg type thing. If you knew that Starkey was in the original book, you'd read it and go, "Oh, that's clever." Um, so it's like I said, I'm on the second book now. I'm almost done writing the third book. It's taken me forever to write it um, because of all the other projects I got going on, but. Um, it it should be four. Uh, I'm going to get a third book finished, hopefully by the end of this month, middle of February, and then um, we'll see if I write the fourth one right away. I've got another book waiting in the wings that everybody that hears about it wants me to write, and so I probably going to write that one after book three. That's you know I've I saw somewhere that this was well, did it say Peter Pan, but not Peter Pan or something. And right. it never dawned on me the second star thing until you just mentioned it. That is <laughs> – that's – A lot of funny. people don't – it's funny because I thought that connection was like very like, oh, yeah, I get it, second star. But everybody that I've told that to when they ask me about it, they're like, oh, you mean second star to the right? I'm like, yeah, that's right. And they're like, okay. See, now that's – this book is kind of one of my – I guess you can call it a guilty pleasure. I love it when authors take – like fairy tales and stuff that you know, and then just completely twist it around. Right. Um, one of the first ones I remember reading is I'm, I'm turning and look at my shelf. Is is it Marissa Mayer, Marissa Myers' um, book Cinder? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I know what that book is, but I haven't read it yet. I I, I remember reading the first book and really liking it, and then I was pissed off because it was going to be a year until book two came out, and I found <laughs> out that she was only doing one book every year. So I actually refused to read the series until the whole series was out. I bought them as they came out, but they just sat on my shelf. Right. I was waiting for all of it to be published, which is all published, but between the time the first book came out and now, I discovered an indie publishing, and so my to-be-read list is <laughs> incredibly oh. long right now. Now. Oh so, yeah, but she's she's doing a graphic novel with it now. I think that comes out soon. She's done uh, a new take on Alice and is it Alice in Wonderland now? I think. Um, yeah, I think so. And then e each one of the books in the Cinder series takes another kind of fairy tale character and a twist on it. So those are those are some of my favorite. I love it when people do kind of stuff like that. Yeah, I hope that when I get the books done, uh, I mean they. They do okay now. I I hope that when I get the books done, it it, it picks up. I'm going to put them all together. Um, you know, obviously, uh, when the fourth one comes out in kind of a a book bundle, and 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 pin it as that. But uh, I I really enjoy writing it. The characters are super fun to write, um, and uh, some of the cool some some of the cool things that happen in book three, um, book because book three uh, book three deals uh, with some of how the lost boys got together. And so some of those uh, scenes are very cool and bring a, a several characters that aren't in book two into the, or that are kind of referenced in book two, kind of into the front of, uh, of the narrative. And it's very fun to write it. Okay. Yeah. That's, I'm definitely moving it up on my to be read list now. So, um, and so you said you're writing book three. Do you, do you have, you said you're going to try to finish it by the end of the month. Do you have a time frame in your mind on when book three might be released? Um, I'm, I'm aiming to release it 
in this spring. So probably in uh, late February, early March, if everything goes well, um, that could be affected by the uh, planning and re- releasing of uh, Explorations 3 which is the the third anthology in the exploration series. I'm I'm helping Nathan and uh, a couple other people uh, put together the the bones of that anthology, <clears throat> and so that that takes up a little bit of time. But I think I think that I can. I'm basically the book is written, but I'm going back and revising some things, and um, I have to add a scene and you know all the stuff that comes with revising. I think you know. Uh, writing the book was really easy, you know, getting the bare bones down. But when you go back and fill in some of the things and you've got some plot points that don't really work out and you've got to rewrite these and change characters here, that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort for me not to, cause I hate to read a book where I'm like, well, that's dumb. Why did they do that? There's no reason for them to do that. And so I try to make everything that my characters do. I try to give them logical reasonings and a logical path to get to where that is. And sometimes it's, it's a lot harder to write. Um, on the second draft than it is the first draft. And you you mentioned that you have another book series that that you're wanting to write. Can you give us any hints on what that storyline might be about, or do you prefer to keep that a secret for now? No, I can talk about it. Okay. Um, I uh, I've always been a huge fan of military science fiction, and and we just got done on Keystroke Medium talking about a military science fiction as a three part how to series. Um, but Two of my favorite movies are uh, Courage Under Fire with Denzel Washington and Black Hawk Down. Okay. And, um, and so I had an idea of what happens when you combine those two and then throw it into a military science fiction setting. So the book is called Edge of Valor, and basically it follows a – investigator that has been tasked with figuring out why this particular mission failed and what happened and why everybody is 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 dead now there are three survivors from the mission that have that actually have gone down on this mission to on another planet and in this in this universe in this series it's it's um there's there aren't any aliens in this in this series there it's just um if you take like humanity is spread amongst the stars, kind of like David Weber's universe where there's, you know, hundreds of planets and star nation states and stuff like that. And, um, he is investigating, you know, what happened and he's talking to these survivors. And when he goes to talk to these survivors, um, the reader then it, it it's told in, in third person limited from the perspective, investigator's perspective but when he interviews the survivors it goes to a first person limited from their point of view and their interpretation of what happened um the only catch is that they're lying and um he's got to figure out why they're lying about what happened on the mission and um so and, and when you read the the three different perspectives of three different stories, they're not going to completely overlap because I think that would be boring. And people are like, I I just read 50 pages of the same thing all over again. So it's going to start in different points of the mission at different specific instances where we we need to show a, a, that, that, that the stories aren't matching up. Okay. And so it's i I'm, I'm, I'm going to start writing that I think in June and I'm going to write that over the summer and, and try to have it done by November. And uh, I, I really think that I've, I've already got the cover done. I've had the cover done for um, several months now. And I, I, I paid a guy in uh, in France uh, to do this cover based off his artwork. And he, he did a phenomenal job. And I haven't I've shown it to like three people and they're like, that is the coolest cover. <laughs> Uh, so it's really killing me not to share it, but, um, since the book technically isn't written yet, I I don't want to put it out there and then, you know, have stuff go through and so, but that's my plan. Um, did you find him through, I know you did, uh, breaking through and the whole second star series with the 99 designs. Did you find him through that site? No, I, 
I found – how did I find him? Uh, I – I think what happened is I was I was searching through um, either DeviantArt.com or like I did a Google search for like concept art uh, for science fiction landscapes because I, I like to get concept art for like motivation or inspiration when I'm writing different scenes. And I found some of his art and I was like, holy crap, that's really, really good. I, I like that. And I sent him an email just kind of – out of the blue and said, Hey, do you, do you do book covers? And he said, yep, I do book covers. Um, he doesn't do the typography, but it'll do the image and, um, very reasonably priced. His name is, uh, Florent Lamas. It's F L O F L O R E N T L L A M A S. And, um, super, super work. And, uh, I, I, I wish that I, I could have used him for the, the second star covers, but the, the second star covers, I wanted, uh, the kind of, um, adventure type Peter Pan feel where it's, it's not a very serious look. You know what I mean? It's more like a, a cartoony look, even though the, 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 the books are serious, but so yeah, very, very nice guy to work with. Okay. Um, now did you have any challenges in writing from going from writing second star to, getting because it sounds like you know your second star sci-fi and then this is more of a space exploration thing that you're doing did you have any challenges in switching from one story to the other well i i can tell you that the specific challenge i have that uh, i'm really looking forward to be done with on second star is that the the main character, John, who's from our world, who goes over to Neverland, doesn't have any um, base knowledge on any of the tech that's over there. Like mm. it's it's similar. Like there's there's um, all the tech over there is based on gravity and uh, affecting gravity. So you know they have um, these transports that they call skiffs, um, but he doesn't know. As a character, he doesn't know how they work. He doesn't know what they're called. He doesn't know brand names. He doesn't know anything about that. And so, and and a lot of the characters that are that live there, they're not. I mean, they're they're the Lost Boys, right? So they're not in uh, a day job. They don't, you know, they don't really have a lot of uh, technical information knowledge. They just do, right? So it's hard to go through a book and. Um, I like to know like what things are called. Like when I write military science fiction, I'll have like the engine be like a TL 85 R quasi turbine turbine ion powered engine or something. Right. I'd mm -hmm. like to know that stuff, mm -hmm. but in this particular series, they don't know any of that. Uh, so I can't, I, I can't put that into the narrative because the characters don't know it and they don't care because right. they're right. So that's a struggle for me in this book. But in going to like say my short stories that are science fiction, uh, military, those characters know and they're aware of their world in, in a more kind of overall uh, knowledge base. They know what's going on, so I can put that in there. So that's not, it's not a challenge switching between. It's actually more of a relief because I can kind of do more of what I want to do with the different series that I can't do a second star. So okay, um, and as you said, you're in a new anthology that comes out. Uh, here in a couple of days called Explorations First Contact. Um, right. And before that was Explorations Through the Wormhole. Do you have to read one anthology before you read the other? No. Um, the the Explorations anthology is themed in that it has wormholes and very vaguely in the same universe. It, it It's technically the same universe, but um, – Nathan basically he gave us a timeline and said from from this day to this day this is the timeline that I have set up and these are the different technologies along that timeline that you can use wherever you put your story in. Um, in First Contact, it's the same universe, the same companies, the same uh, planet, and all those stories are connected. Like for instance, in my story. We start off my story with my captain and Ralph Kern's captain talking in a bar. Okay. And 
his story has part of the conversation and my story has part of the conversation. But if you don't read both, you only get half of the conversation. Okay. Um, so they're in first contact, they're a lot more intertwined, but still standalone short stories that you don't, they're not in any order. They're not like, it's not the overall story is there in the background about what's going on. Um, but they aren't connected and the the anthologies like through the wormhole and first contact aren't connected. They're not in the same universe. So it doesn't matter. You can read one story out of first contact and then one story at a wormhole and there's no, there's no connectivity there. Okay. Uh, you want to give people more, uh, I guess, an explanation or how, how did you get inter- uh, introduced into this project and then about your stories in each of those? Um, yeah. So um, like I said at the beginning, uh, Ralph Kern was our first guest on uh, our live show, Keystroke Medium. And through Ralph, he was like, hey, I read your your breaking through uh, novella and I really liked it. And I think that you do, uh, really good in this anthology that we're putting together. So he got with Nathan and, and introduced Nathan to my work and Nathan really liked it and said, yeah, let's, let's get him on board. And so they get, and I came in late. I came in when I came in, we only had a month left to write. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so <laughs> no pressure. So, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, I, I was like, well, I'm, I'm going to try to come up with something, uh, like cross your fingers and we'll see what happens. <laughs> and, um, I actually did a, um, a YouTube project on that. It was one of the first things I did on YouTube is I, I basically streamed almost the entire writing process for the, the short story on my YouTube channel. Like I just, I'd sign into Twitch and hit broadcast and then I'd start writing and you'd see a little picture of me and then you could see my monitor as I'm writing the story. And, uh, for a long time, I didn't have any idea what I was going to do, and I didn't want it to be um, – They, I guess they had a lot of stories where the, the wormhole closed and completely cut these other people off from Earth. And they're like, we don't want any more of those. Uh, see if you can come up with something different. And I was like, OK, uh, uh, what am I going to come up with? <laughs> <laughs> so I spent several days thinking about it and kind of just jotting down ideas, and finally I decided, OK, well, what happens if they get stuck in the wormhole? Okay. And and kind of like in a in a hyperspace, I don't know thing, and that's kind of where the story grew out of. And and uh, part of the timeline was um, intelligent animals, and I really wanted to write one of those, so I created a a what I call a chatter monkey. And basically, my vision for this chatter monkey is it looks like a a howler monkey, you know, like the little ones that are mm-hmm. cute except that he's purple and silver and he's got like huge ears and that's his name is ears. And he talks w- with a really deep sarcastic voice to kind of throw off, um, his size. And, you know, typically you think of, of a high, high pitched cute voice. And I was like, no, 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 he's going to have a really deep voice. So when Jacob Cooper, who did the audio uh, book, he got a hold of me and he said, so how do you want this guy to sound? And I, and I said this and he goes, Oh, I got the best accent for that at all he made him slightly english and it yeah it works it works really good it was <laughs> i laugh every time i hear the the voice i laugh because it's just so cool that is awesome and which uh, which story was that one in again that's um that's called the lost colony in the uh the wormhole through the wormhole series okay and did you you say that's available on audiobook or is it, it coming it, out it will be. Okay. I, I don't. I don't know at the time. Uh, I. I don't know at the time of this broadcast if it's out or not. Okay. Um. It should be out in the next week or so as we're recording this. So it's it's uh, Saturday, January fourteenth. So it should be out in the next month or so, or next week or so. But I'm not exactly positive. But it will be out. And Jacob Cooper, um, under the pen name Keith Michelson, did the, um. The recording and okay. it just very very good recording. I just clicked on it to get the audio book and it wasn't there, so it threw me for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I've actually I've got a sample on my website, uh, okay. Josh JoshHayesWriter dot com. If you go to my short story section, you'll see that it has a little audio sample and you can listen to the first chapter of the book. It's pretty neat. Awesome. I'll have to do that. Um, and so, can you tell people kind of what your story is about in the new explorations that's coming out here in a few days? Uh, yeah, in first contact, uh, that story is called Harbinger and, um, it is a warship. Harbinger is a warship slash exploration ship 
and they are sent um, – the, the premise of First Contact is that this uh, alien vessel arrived in Earth space and it was dying and it is able to share all this information with the humans about – interstellar travel and how the distortion drive works or i can't remember if it's distortion or displacement drive but one of these drives that lets you go faster in light basically mm-hmm. and uh then it tells them i know of these 14 locations um that have intelligent life but the memory banks have been de- degraded so i don't know what's there basically and um so that's kind of the premise. Okay, now there's 14 places we're going to go, 14 authors, 14 stories. Oh, okay. Um, so my story, my captain um, has her warship. Uh, her name is Carol Ferris, and she is a very um, no-nonsense type of captain. And they go into this um, – they go into this system, and they find a – kind of a derelict space station and they're not getting any calm traffic at all. And that this is very weird because if they've got this space station out there, that's, that's floating around and it's, it's not powered or anything, there should be something going on and they, they, there's not. Um, and so they, they do some exploring on the, on the station. I don't want to give too much away about that, but yeah. then, um, these signals appear, um, out in system and it's some ships and, uh, they send these messages, all of them send these messages to the harbinger and the harbinger has this technology that, uh, translates, um, thought and, and text or, uh, speech basically into text and speech that they could understand. And, um, That's a pretty cool thing. I don't want to give that away either. But so they get these messages from these incoming ships. One of them says, I'm the last one. Help me. And another one says, we're the last ones. Help us or something along those lines. And the captain has to make a decision on if she's going to help these, um, who's she going to help? And, you know, what are the repercussions for her helping one and not the other? And uh, then the book goes on from there. Uh but I, I, I got a message from the editor, uh, who's female, and she said I really liked your female captain. And I'm, I'm. That's one of my, my biggest fears as a writer is I like writing female characters, and my biggest fear as a writer is not accurately portraying a female character in my writing. And so to get a, a the editor who's uh, a woman to say, hey, I really liked your character. That made me feel really good about it. That is awesome. And so that comes out here in a few days. Um, it's av- available for pre-order on Amazon. So head on over there and search for Explorations First Contact. Absolutely. Well, here at um, the Legendarium, we like to end on a little segment that we call the Legendary Ending. So these are just some little random questions that may or may not be about writing. Um, Fire away. (laughs) I'm ready. The first one is, what songs are currently on your writing playlist? Uh, Right now, I have... I have... I don't listen to um, music with words in it. Typically when I write, I like writing to uh, listening to soundtracks. My favorite soundtrack to listen to is Tron Legacy. Uh, Daft Punk did the soundtrack to that movie, and it's a very cool, like, cyberpunk, upbeat type music. Uh, right now, for some reason, I'm listening to music from the Warcraft movie. And uh, I, I, I have that on replay usually and uh, listen to that. And I've also listened to, like, Mad Max's soundtrack, and that's pretty – I tried to write a. Uh, I had to write a romance scene one time for one of the short stories, and Mad Max was playing in the background. I was like, I need to change the soundtrack here because <laughs> it's it's not doing anything for me. <laughs> that is hilarious. Um, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse, which one of your book characters would you want to be stuck with, and why? Oh man, um, I'd have to say Bella from second star because uh she is phenomenal when it comes to tinkering with things mm-hmm. oh, there we go. <laughs> uh-huh 
<laughs> and uh, she creates uh, some some pretty cool weapons and uh, some other cool things in the story that uh, I would probably need in a zombie apocalypse. So I'd take Bella. Okay. Now, if you were stuck in a zombie apocalypse with any character from any kind of media source, books, comics, movies, television, video games, whatever, uh, what character would you want to be stuck with and why? Oh, man. Maybe Bond. Okay. Bond uh, never dies, and he very rarely misses. And uh, apparently he can jump off trains and survive. So there we go. uh, I'd take Bond. There we go. That works. If you had a time machine, where would you travel and why? Oh, man. I, you know, I, I would love to travel the future. Um, and and just you know go a couple hundred years in the future and just see where we're at you know see if we see if we make it into space see what that's like like um, I I wish that we were in a time where space travel was a, a reality right now like <clears throat> not like just going up in the orbit but you know where there's colonies and really cool like not like quite like a Star Wars uh, level because you know the Empire is a uh, pretty oppressive and I'd, I'd rather not meet Vader uh, in person, but uh, something along those lines may, might be pretty cool. And uh, so one of these questions is someone that one of the, a fan of the, the podcast has asked, and I've never, I don't think I've asked anybody this one yet. Um, yes. It's, do you have any story ideas that you're interested in writing, but you know, or think that it would never sell, never sell? Story ideas that I'm interested in writing, but probably would never sell. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, Do you have any well, of those or no? I I have a lot of ideas, and whether or not they'd sell or not, I don't know. I do have, <laughs> I do have an idea for uh, a. I'm not sure if it would be middle grade or YA, but a a, a science fiction. I want to say science fiction, Harry Potter, but that's a huge like misnomer. It's not really that, mm-hmm. um, but that kind of feel where it's written. F- I want to write a series where, like that, I would have as a kid read and been like, "This is a really really cool series." Um, but you know, with the ebook market the way it is, kids, I don't know how how profit it, it would be unless I went through like a traditional publishing place. Okay. Um, so that's a, I think it's a good idea, but I'm just not sure if it would, if it's going to pan out to, to be profitable or not. Okay. And if you could have one superpower, which one would you have and why? I would love to fly. I would love to fly. (laughs) I think flying is the coolest. Like I envy birds, not that they're can't speak and that they have to sleep outside and that they get shot out of the air at duck season. But, uh, I, just to be able to fly up there and get a completely new perspective and just be open and, uh, man, that would be super cool. I'd fly all the time. There we go. I'd fly on the podcast. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Coming to you from above Dallas this week. (laughs) You you can barely hear me because the wind's just (laughs) going crazy on the mic. That's funny. And of course, the uh, the question that we're kind of famous for here: a penguin walks through that door right now wearing a sombrero. What does he say, and why is he here? <clears throat> okay, so I uh, came to this on the fly, and I think it's pretty funny, but I'm not sure how funny it's going to go over. So the penguin walks into the bar. He's wearing a sombrero, and he looks around. and He goes, "Ha ha! Really funny guys wearing my pants." <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's he's uh, he's trying to get back to the bus station to get to the Arctic. But uh, that's my that's my joke. That works. And then <laughs> before we leave, do you have any ad- advice, whether it be for writing or for life, that you would like to share with listeners? Everybody says when it comes to to writing, you know, just to write, and it's it's very kind of like yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But um, a lot of people in the indie indie world today are are they make a a point to say, if you want to make it as a, as an indie writer, you need to be producing fiction and you need to write, you know, a book a month, a book every couple of months, but you need to have that, that content coming out there and you need to put those words out there and just get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. Uh, I'm the complete opposite of that. I, 
I, I, th- I think I've, I've known authors that have tried to do that and just stress out and get really demotivated when it comes to producing all that content. And even, even then the, the, some of the authors that produce that content, you can tell that they have sped through it and they, they haven't put a lot of time into it and they, it's very rough. And so my, my advice would be to, you know, most of us have full-time jobs. Most of us have families. Um, if you only get a couple hours a week to write, take that couple hours a, a week and enjoy what you're doing because you're not like for me, I have a full-time job and I have a part-time job and I have a family and I have, you know, three kids uh, fourth on the way. And so sometimes I have big plans. I'm going to go down and write for an hour. And then the baby barfs all over the couch and I end up cleaning that all up and I get frustrated that I don't get to write, but that's okay because I'm not, I'm not trying to write to put food on the table, whether I was, whether I'm making $5 a month or $5,000 a month, writing is fun for me. That's why I do it. So if you're doing it for the love of writing, don't worry about trying to put out a, a novel a month or, or whatever, just sit down, relax, enjoy what you're doing and have a blast, uh, writing and, and doing what you like doing. Sounds good. Where can our listeners go if they'd like to learn more about you or your stories? Uh, you can go to my personal website, which is uh, joshhayswriter.com. And uh, that has my blog that I hardly ever update. Um, you can find all my books there. You can find the samples from books that I have in anthologies, and I mentioned that audio sample. You can listen to the first chapter of my Through the Wormhole story. Um, You can also go to my podcast website, which is updated way more frequently, um, and you get to see my uh, face is keystrokemedium.com and that is a joint podcast with scott moon and ralph kern and so we have our our all the shows that we've done on that is on the website and uh, also a calendar with upcoming guests and, and different things like that so sounds good we'll put links to all of uh those places in the show notes over at legendarium.com and we'll even put up a book preview for breaking through or explorations uh whichever one you want us to put up we'll put one of those up oh awesome that'd be fantastic well thanks for coming on today and uh doing 30 minute author interviews we appreciate it well thank you for having me i I had a good time well guys that's all the time we've got for this episode thank you so much for tuning in to 30 minute author interviews we hope you come back next wednesday and every wednesday for a brand new episode And head on over to Legendarium.com, that's L-E-I-G-H-G-E-N-D-A-R-I-U-M.com, and check out the show notes for this episode. Josh Hayes has a giveaway for two audiobook copies of Explorations Through the Wormhole. And we'd like to give a shout out to a couple of our Patreon subscribers. We'd like to say thank you to Diane S. Loftus, Third Scribe, and Maggie Stewart Grant. They have supported 30-minute author interviews over at Patreon. Head on over to patreon.com slash legendarium. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash l-e-i-g-h-g-e-n-d-a-r-i-u-m. And check out the different rewards we have. We have uh, t-shirts as rewards. We have a special Patreon-only podcast called 10 Questions With where we're going to be asking authors 10 questions and many other rewards. So thank you to those three for supporting us on Patreon. And until next time, guys, remember to stay legendary. Oh, screwed that one up. Blooper reel.